So if you haven't already heard the news, Joe Rogan caught COVID. Listen up, everybody. I have some news. So let's talk about his response to his infection. At the onset of symptoms, he self-isolated, as is the responsible thing to do. He got tested as soon as possible. Then, we immediately threw the kitchen sink at it, all kinds of meds. His cocktail included monoclonal antibodies, ivermectin, z pack and prednisone. He also got an NAD drip and a vitamin drip three days in a row. Now, before we go any further, I want to stress that we don't know if Joe has or has not been vaccinated. He has yet to say publicly whether he is vaccinated. He told Variety News back in April, I'm not an anti-vax person. In fact, I said I believe they're safe and I encourage many people to take them. I just said healthy people don't need to get vaccinated. I don't think that if you're a young, healthy person that you need it. While this statement is not directly dismissive of the virus or the vaccination, it has implications that must be considered when dealing with an influencer with as wide spread popularity as Joe Rogan. When you have a viewership numbering in the millions, there are always larger societal implications to the things that you say. Initially, it was true that COVID didn't seem all that bad for healthy people, but due to the emergence of variants, the virulence has changed and now even healthy people are getting sick. Over 95% of the people who are admitted to the hospital right now are unvaccinated. Some of these people are actually young and otherwise healthy. In an article for the CBC, an intensive care physician, Dr. Lovedeep Kara, warns we are in big trouble and that patients being admitted to UHNBC are coming in sicker, younger, and requiring ICU and intubation faster than in previous waves. Kara said before they are intubated, almost every patient is crying and saying, don't let me die. I'm scared. So when the chance that a young person is indirectly influenced by a celebrity into not taking the vaccine, the following must be considered. Number one, while you can be healthy and not necessarily die from it, you may take up resources and hospital space that might otherwise be used to care for someone else who is ill, not just with COVID, but with any health issue. Number two, inside of you, the virus is still replicating and you are giving it another opportunity to mutate and potentially become stronger. Number three, if it is replicating inside of you and you are fighting it through natural immunity, the viral count in your bloodstream will be higher than an infected vaccinated person. Studies have confirmed this. So if myself, who has been vaccinated, and an unvaccinated carrier of the virus both infect a third party, the dose that is transmitted from the unvaccinated carrier will be worse than the dose from myself if the duration of exposure is the same. Basically, I'm saying that the decision to be unvaccinated is a decision that you make for yourself, but that has very real ramifications on other people in your environment. Does something rhyme with shellfish? So I'm not sure if Joe has changed his statements since the introduction of the Delta variant, but these facts must be taken into consideration. You don't live on an island. The world's population is more than one. Many places around the world, intensive care staff are feeling a very real strain. Our medical system is only designed to handle so much. While we still don't know if Joe is vaccinated, we know how heavily he leaned on modern medical solutions, many of which have little to no research surrounding their long-term effects to nullify the virus. Rogan said he took monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z uh, uh prednisone, everything. All kinds of meds, including an NAD drip and a vitamin drip three days in a row. Monoclonal antibodies are a therapy that have been shown to lessen the effects of COVID and are the only treatment option for people with mild to moderate cases who aren't yet in hospital. In most locales, it has been approved only for emergency use and it is administered to people who have just been exposed or who have tested positive and have mild to moderate illness. The main drug used is a dual antibody cocktail called Regeneron the same drug used to treat Donald Trump when he was hospitalized. It contains lab-created antibodies that specifically target the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Ivermectin is a medication that is used to treat parasitic roundworm infections. It works by paralyzing and killing parasites. Although this is its main action, it has apparently exhibited antiviral activity against a number of RNA and DNA viruses, such as Zika, Dengue, and Yellow Fever. It is currently being studied for its efficacy against COVID and has not yet been approved for use as a treatment or a prophylactic. Some studies have suggested that it might be effective. This user was a very big fan of ivermectin and referred me to this El Ghazar et al. study out of Egypt. It 
was one of the biggest trials looking at ivermectin for COVID-19. It was about a 90% reduction in mortality in hospitalized COVID patients when they were treated with ivermectin compared to if they weren't. It was such a big study that it was actually included in a lot of meta-analyses. But the largest of these studies has been retracted due to concerns of fraud. Unfortunately, it was actually retracted for ethical concerns because the study authors actually plagiarized a large part of it and actually falsified a lot of the data. And this was such a big deal that Andrew Hill and his meta-analysis actually withdrew the entire meta-analysis from preprint and said that he was going to rerun the analysis without the El Gazer et al. study because 20% of his total analysis was dependent upon the data from the El Gazer et al. study, which was deemed to be fraudulent. So at this time, we are not sure if it is actually effective and if it is what the effective dose is. It's also important to note that there are other meta-analyses out there that do not include the El Gazer et al fraudulent data set and um, they look at studies of ivermectin versus standard of care and ivermectin versus placebo and these meta-analyses show that there is no benefit to ivermectin as a preventative or a therapeutic for COVID-19. z -pack is the common name given to a course of the antibiotic azithromycin. It is a commonly prescribed antibiotic that is used to treat bacteria that cause ear infections, pneumonia, upper respiratory infections, throat infections, and STDs. It kills bacteria by preventing protein synthesis. Antibiotics generally do not work against viruses, which are a different form of organism. Azithromycin was initially considered as a potential treatment for COVID as a result of its anti-inflammatory properties. However, subsequent study has shown that it offers no clinical benefit in treating COVID. It will only offer benefit if there is a concurrent bacterial infection at the same time. Prednisone is a corticosteroid that is used to decrease the negative effects of systemic inflammation that damages the lung and other organs during COVID infection. It has been shown to decrease the risk of death after infection and the duration of mechanical ventilation, but has been associated with delayed virus clearance and can have other negative side effects. It is recommended for use in an outpatient setting only with patients who have a need for supplemental oxygen and is not recommended for routine use. NAD drip is an intravenous infusion of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. NAD is a metabolic coenzyme that has a myriad of roles including mitochondrial function, DNA and cell repair, gene activation and deactivation, and maintaining neurotransmitter function. NAD deficiency has been associated with higher mortality with COVID, so NAD supplementation has been hypothesized as a potential treatment. However, to my knowledge, there are no studies yet that show that it is effective as a treatment or as a prophylactic. Vitamin drips, particularly those with high levels of vitamin C, have been suggested by some as effective in the protection against and treatment of COVID. High dose vitamin C has previously been useful for the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock following bacterial infection. While preliminary data would suggest that high dose vitamin C may improve oxygen requirements in patients who are already intubated, it does not support the use of vitamin drips as a treatment in infected patients who are not yet intubated. So when a well-respected celebrity throws the kitchen sink, at a virus like COVID, we must again consider the widespread societal repercussions. These drugs are not necessarily benign or proven effective in this context. Moreover, the effects of taking them all together at the same time are also unknown, and dare I say, experimental. Hiya! It is strange to me that Joe would be so outspoken about taking a cocktail of this sort and not equally forthcoming about whether or not he has taken the vaccine. He might be influencing people to take things that have not yet been shown to work. And we cannot give him a free pass due to his celebrity status. I think there is a double standard that must be addressed here. If some dude on Facebook said to take two big swigs of Roundup Power Max herbicide, a whole bottle of ibuprofen, and some horse steroids all at once, and he was the same person that I let influence my opinion on whether I should or shouldn't take the vaccine for COVID in either direction, then perhaps I have some self-reflection to do. People are less critical of less proven methods presented by social icons instead of what the doctors are saying. And this most definitely should not be the case. So can you tell me why nobody wants to believe the doctors? Many of the people making claims about COVID and the vaccination aren't the ones in the operating room. They aren't in the ICU or on the front lines in the emergency department. And they certainly aren't the ones comforting people as they die 
in isolation. When it comes to matters of critical importance, a person's area of expertise must be taken into account. If you distrust the media, ask a doctor. I wouldn't let a carpenter give me a tattoo. If you understand anything about the scientific principle, then you know that skepticism is at the basis of all things scientific. So, you know, we're not hiding ivermectin from you. We're not censoring ivermectin, but we do hold people to certain ethical and academic standards when dealing with your health, right? When, when conducting studies that are going to impact your health. You want us to have ethical standards and practices. Basically, doubt everything until there is reproducible evidence to back up the explanation for events that have transpired. This includes the treatments that have been proposed for the illness at hand. While it was understandable that people were initially skeptical of the vaccine, we now have data that suggests that it is quite effective for certain periods of time. Although it is not 100% effective forever, it is certainly more so than no immunization or any of the other proposed treatments. The data supports this. So while people argue about the origins of the disease or how the Illuminati are using the pandemic to obtain control of the global population, the fire is literally burning around us when we have an extinguisher in our hands. And to be honest, what's the difference between taking the vaccine or any of the other proposed treatments. People worry about what is in the vaccine or about its long-term effects. But can any of these people speak cogently about what is in ivermectin or about its long-term effects when used in this context? Especially when used in combination with a host of other unproven treatments such as with Joe Rogan. I think not. Sounds a little experimental to me. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho.